All right, guess what the first song is? Our first song tonight will be song 453. 453. We'll sing the first and third verse of Love Lifted Me. Sounds like Wednesday night, then. 453. Let's all sing. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stayed within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, and from the waters lifted me, now safe am I. Her love lifted me, her love lifted me, when nothing else could help. Her love lifted me, her love lifted me, her love lifted me, when nothing else could help. Love lifted me. Danger, look above, Jesus completely saves, and he will lift you by his love out of the angry waves. For he's the master of the sea, fills his will, obey, and he your savior wants to be, be saved today. Cause love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, the love lifted me, the love lifted me, the love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Our next song will be song number 176, Lamb of God, 176. And again, let's all sing. Your only son, no sin to hide, but you have him from your side to walk upon this guilty son and to become the Lamb of God. Your gift of love, they crucified, they laughed and scorned him as he died. The humble king, they made a fraud and sacrificed the Lamb of God. O Lamb of God, sweet Lamb of God, I love the holy Lamb of God. O wash me in his precious blood, my Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. I was so lost. I should have died, but you have brought me to your side to be led by your step and rod and to be called a Lamb of God. O Lamb of God, sweet Lamb of God, I love the holy Lamb of God. O wash me in his precious blood. My Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. Oh, Lamb of God, sweet Lamb of God, I love the holy Lamb of God. Oh, wash me in His precious blood. My Jesus Christ, the Lamb of Before we have our scripture reading and opening prayer, we'll sing song number 71, please. Song number 71, As the Deer. And following this song, we'll have our scripture reading and our opening prayer. Can somebody get the Lord's Supper now? As the Deer. Let's all sing. As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you. You alone are my heart's desire I long to worship you. You alone are my strength, my shield. To you alone may my spirit yield. For you alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. I want you more than gold. Or silver only you can satisfy. You alone are the real joy giver and the apple of my eye. You alone are my strength, my shield. 
To you alone may my spirit heal. For you alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. Scripture in this evening will come from Psalm chapter 133, verse 1. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for our many blessings. And we thank you for this opportunity that we have to be here tonight, Father. We pray for those in the hospitals and those that are sick. And we pray that you will bring them back to us at your appointed time. Father, most of all, we thank you for your Son, Jesus, and we ask that you would forgive us when we fall short. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. The next song will be song number 679. 679. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. We're going to sing the first and fourth verse, please. 679. And again, let's all sing. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Just to take Him at His word, just to rest upon His promise, just to know the saints of Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I prove Him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus. Before we have our lesson, we'll sing song number 300. Song number 300. Get there first. And the song before the lesson, or following the lesson, excuse me, will be 911. 911 will be the invitation song. We'll sing 1, 2, and 4. At this time with 300, we'll sing 1, 2, and 3. And it's convenient. Why don't we stand up? Praise Him, praise Him. All three verses. And again, let's all sing. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Sing of oh earth His wonderful love proclaim. Hail Him, hail Him, highest our kingdoms in glory. Strength and honor, give Him His holy name. Like a shepherd, Jesus will guard His children. In his arms he carries them all day long. Praise him, praise him, tell him the excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, every joyful song. Praise him, praise him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. For our sins he suffered and bled and died. He our rock, our hope of eternal salvation. Hail Him, hail Him, Jesus the crucified. Sound His praises, Jesus who broke our sorrows. Love unbounded, wonderful, deep and strong. Praise Him, praise Him, help His excellent greatness. Praise Him, praise Him, every joyful song. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Heavenly portals, loud goes out of rain. Jesus, Savior, reign forever and ever. Crown Him, crown Him, broad and free and king. Christ is coming over the world victorious. Power and glory unto the Lord belong. So praise Him, praise Him, tell 
Good evening. If you have your Bibles with me, turn with me to James chapter 2. James chapter 2. Uh, I don't have a PowerPoint with me. James chapter 2. And we'll start in verse 1. And it reads, My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings and fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to one wearing the fine clothes, and say to him, You all sit here in a good place, and say to the poor man, You stand there, or sit here at my footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves, and become, and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom, which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the, dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? Do they, do they not blaspheme that noble name by which you were called? If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbors yourself. You do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble, in one point he is guilty of all. For he who said, Do not commit adultery, also said, Do not murder. Now if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak, and so do, as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. We live in an image-driven culture. Do we agree? You've got to wear the right clothes, have the right haircut, live in the right neighborhood. This has created, if you will, a celebrity culture. Many American churches have gotten caught up in this image-driven trap. They believe that you have to create just the right atmosphere to draw the people they want into their church. They do this by creating a concert atmosphere, fog lights, fog machines, and great musicians. Some have made it all about how you dress, whether it's dress to the nines to see who can draw the most attention. There are a few things people need to know about us before they're willing to listen. They need to know we care and they need to know that we're fair, and they need to know that we're there. Let's see how James teaches his readers to prove these three things to people who may not yet know Christ. James demonstrates showing people you care with two simple words, my brothers. You see, James had already greeted his readers. He writes, my brothers, to indicate that he's writing from a place of concern. It's like a big brother speaking as a mentor to younger brothers and sisters. He's coming from a place of concern. People are looking for people who care, but they don't want you to be your next project. Sometimes showing we care is as simple as saying hello, asking how a person's doing, and then listen. During your fellowship time, how many of you catch yourselves asking someone how they're doing and moving on to the next person before you get an answer? I know there are times when I've done that. But what might happen if we stop to listen and let them give an honest answer? There was one time a young man on my football team had a rough day after his job. He could see it written all over his face. I asked him how he was doing and he told me fine. Preparing to move along, I caught his arm and asked him, I said, no really, how are you? And he acknowledged that he was struggling and that I cared. And of course we sat down past time and talked about it. But people will also want us to know that we're fair. They want to know that they'll be treated the same as everyone else. James uses an obvious example, rich versus poor. If you've ever seen the movie Speed, the bad guy planted bombs and then called the hero to say, pop quiz. I can picture James saying, pop quiz, two men walk into the back of a church, one is all decked out in fancy suit, gold rings, and a Rolex watch. The other looks rather awful, like he'd been out all night before showing up at the door. What do you do? James tells us what not to do, don't show partiality to one over the other. See, we should never judge a book by its cover. We don't want to make assumptions based on initial appearance. We're called to be impartial. So whether a person is handicapped, poor, or disadvantaged in some other way, to treat them unfairly is a disgrace to God and he will deal with it. Notice he tells those who might do such things to fear him. If we choose to mistreat people whom God has created and loved, then watch out. A few verses later, God tells us to love your neighbor as yourself. If we wouldn't like being pushed aside and forgotten because of our handicapped or financial status, if it would frustrate us if someone was cruel to us because of the way we looked or the way we weren't in the right class of people, then we need to make sure we're not treating anyone else this way. 
Put yourself in their shoes and treat them the way you would like to be treated. James chapter 2, 1 through 4, I'll read it again. My brothers, as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, don't show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in shabby clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, Here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, You stand there or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? And that is out of the ESV. James makes it clear, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, there's no room for bias, no room for discrimination. And if there's no room for it in the church, then there's no room for it in your heart or any part of your life. And again, just like this in Leviticus passage, a few verses later, James says, if you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. If love rules your life, then you are doing right. There was a story on Facebook later shown to be fiction that was written to illustrate this point. Since then, various preachers have put their congregations to the test, dressing to appear homeless to see what their people thought. There's a story on Twitter shared by a friend of mine. The story goes, she told us about a time they had a homeless man that would come from time to time to utilize their services, but refused to get the help needed to get off the streets. They continued to care for him as best as he allowed. After he passed away, his family found his will which included a $500,000 donation to his ministry. We need to recognize that in our human nature, we tend to be drawn to people that we want to be like, while neglecting the ones we don't. The problem with this is that we forget that all the people are made in God's image and often begin using them for our own purposes. We lose sight that the last will be first and the first will be last, and the poor will be the ones who are made rich in faith. Young people especially want to know they'll be treated fair. I've seen churches where kids would come in and being kids left a mess behind as they hadn't been taught proper etique. I only hope they didn't hear the adults that came along to clean things up and gripe because they didn't clean it up. But who cares? We're worried about their salvation. That's more important to them. People want to know we care. They want to know that we're fair and they want to know that we're there. What I mean by this is that we can talk the talk all day long, but do we walk the walk? James refers to it as the royal law. Love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus tells us this is the second greatest command. The first being, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Like we often do, the teacher of law tries to justify himself. Looks for the least he needs to do to have fulfilled this law, to meet the bare minimum. Jesus tells this famous story. A rich man was traveling down to Jericho Road when he was attacked by robbers who took all his things and left him for the dead. A priest was traveling by. I can picture the crowd listening to Jesus thinking, Oh good, here's a godly man that will help the victim. Great story, what a happy ending. But no, the priest crosses to the other side of the road and continues on his way. Soon, the Levite comes traveling down the road and sees a man laying there, moaning and groaning. The crowd is convinced that this good man will surely stop and help the victim, but no, he crosses the road and continues on his way. Then a Samaritan comes by. As soon as that name left Jesus' lips, you can feel the crowd turn. No, you didn't, Jesus. You know those who Samaritans, they're half-breeds. They abandoned the faith and intermarried with other nations. How could you say Samaritan? I don't like this story anymore. Of course, the Samaritan tends to the man's wounds, takes him to a hotel, and pays to make sure the man is cared for until healed, even offering to pay any balance that may exist when he comes back, if you remember that story. So who was the neighbor? The one who helped the victim out. We live in a very hostile political atmosphere. Social media has made it very easy to argue and fight when people disagree. Our nation has been trying to redefine what is life and what is love. When Christians speak up, they try to deflect by asking why it's only these two topics that get Christians involved in the discussions. What about all the other sins like lying and fornication that the church seems to be silent about? Let's be real, there are indeed times when Christians harp on these things and can come across as judgmental, but the reason it seems abortion and homosexuality are focused on less is that people involved in those sins want us to endorse in their lives. They want us to act like it's normal without sin. People who are involved in these other sins recognize that they are doing wrong and are asking for an endorsement of the choices they make. To show that we walk the walk and talk the talk, we need to be working to overcome the sin in our own lives through the power of Christ as we overcome alongside fellow sinners 
and help them along the journey also. James points out that all sin is the same in the sense that the eternal consequence is separation from God. Our differences should not divide us. They should unite us. Galatians chapter 3, verse, starting in verse 26, reads, You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who are baptized in Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. The Jew isn't more of a Christian than the Gentile is. The man isn't closer to God than the female is. The privileged one isn't more favored by God than the less privileged one. They are all equally Christian, equal, equally loved, and equally able to grow in the faith. My clothes doesn't matter, and color doesn't matter. My ethnicity doesn't matter, and what does matter is my heart, my integrity, and my love. We read Psalms chapter 133, verse 1. We read how good and pleasant it is when brothers live together in unity. How good and pleasant indeed. If we want to see true reform take place, it starts with us. Let's go make a difference with the love of Jesus Christ. Tonight, if you have fallen away and want to come back, or if you'd like to be baptized and wash away your sins, we'll do that for you as we stand and as we sing. Bring Christ your broken life. So far by sin, he will forgive you to make all again your de wasted years he will restore and your iniquities remember no more. Bring him your every care, if great or small. Whatever troubles you, oh, bring it all. Bring him the haunting fears, the nameless dread. Thy heart he will relieve and lift up thy head. Blessed Savior of us all, almighty friend. His presence shall be ours unto the end. Without Him life would be how dark, how drear. But with Him morning breaks and heaven is near. That's a tough one. That was a tough one, yeah. I saw myself there not doing what I was supposed to do. The Lord's table has been prepared for those that did not have the opportunity this morning to partake of it. We're going to sing the first verse of song number 350. If you have a need to partake of the Lord's Supper, please come down front and uh, you'll be served. 350, when my love to Christ grows weak. Let's all sing. When my love to Christ grows weak, when for deeper faith I seek, then in thought I go to thee, Garden of Gethsemane. Let's go to God in prayer, please. Our Father God, as we gather around your table to commemorate the, the death, burial, and resurrection of your Son, we recognize that we do this in remembrance of him, not out of tradition, but because we are commanded to do so, and it's the right thing to do in your sight. We pray that as the one that partakes of this right now will we'll do so in, the, in, the, in your sight that will make you happy. For we pray in your son's name, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Again, let's go to God in prayer. Again, Father, we come around your table this time to recognize and remember your son's shed blood on the cross for the remission of our sins. We know that this is the only blood that can do that. And we pray, Father, for the one that's about to partake of it, that he does so in a manner that's pleasing in your sight. Again, we pray in your son's name, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Okay, a good day. 
Have you noticed that Andrew's five minute sermons have turned into regular sermons? That's a good deal. We appreciate that. We really do. We really do. I know I've, uh, I've done one or two uh, over the 35 years that I've been a Christian. And I think I've got a nine, nine hour thing written out. And it's about two minutes is what it is. So if anybody that does this knows what's going on when you do that. So I appreciate what you do. I really, really do, you know. And we appreciate all our young people that, uh, that kick in and do, you know. So that, that's good stuff. Is there anything we need to talk about before we're dismissed? Remember, we've got people traveling. Uh, we've got some back. And uh, let's, let's keep them in our prayers and get them back here. Uh, anything else? If not, let's stand and we'll sing the final song for tonight. Which is... What do I do with it? 858. Okay, now you're getting me, right? 878, you said? All right, let's see what we got. You'll all be happy when Anthony comes back. Sweet by and by. We'll just sing the first verse and then we'll be dismissed in prayer. Let's all sing. There's a land that is fairer than day. And by faith we can see it afar. For the Father waits over the way to prepare us a dwelling place there. In the sweet by and by, who we shall meet on that beautiful shore. In the sweet by and by, who we shall meet on that beautiful shore.